Today, I'm gonna talk about the spiritual power of generosity. I'm continuing the series of Give, Pray, Fast that we're doing across all of our campuses. And it comes from the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter six, where Jesus has this passage, He stops down in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount and He says, when you give, do it like this. When you pray, do it like this. When you fast, do it like this. Not if you give, if you pray and if you fast, when you do it. And that's the order He does it in. Give, pray, fast. So we're focusing on that first, the give part, and then we're gonna head more into the the prayer and the, the fasting part as well. Jesus talks about when you give, when you pray and when you fast, because He expects that to be just a common everyday expectation for every Christian to do. And you know, one of the difficulties with give, pray, fast We all tense up a little bit with those things because they are all sacrifices, aren't they? None of us naturally take to any of those things. Nobody really wants to give and give and give. Nobody really wants to pray and pray and pray. And definitely a lot of us don't wanna fast and fast and fast. Some of us more than others. You know, these are are sacrifices that we make. Because giving means sacrificing money. It means sacrificing lifestyle. It means sacrificing the way we would love to be able to live. Prayer means sacrificing time. I could be watching TV, I could be at the ski fields, I could be in the mall, I could be anywhere, but I'm I'm coming to church today. It's a form of worship. I'm deciding to pray instead of the other things I could do. So it is a sacrifice. And fasting is definitely a sacrifice, isn't it? Because it's going without food. It's choosing to say, I'm not gonna have all those little delicacies. And I've been doing some fasting just recently. And isn't it incredible that when you fast, you get invited out and people make these incredible things for you and put them in front of you. And you think, you know, really, if um, if I was a good, thankful person, I would just eat this because it's good to be able to be appreciative. And it's very hard to say no to some of those things. Very, very hard. And it is a sacrifice. Do you know that sacrifice is an important part of worship? Right back to the very, very beginning of the the, the Bible, right back in Genesis. In fact, the first disturbance that happened was between Cain and Abel. They were making a sacrifice to God and one had a better sacrifice than the other. Sacrifice goes all the way back. It's a form of worship. Now, you'll probably be very pleased that we're not in an Old Testament church today or Old Testament synagogue, because if we were, we would be bringing up, um, uh, we would be bringing in animals to sacrifice to God. And so you'd be bringing a live animal and I would have a nice big knife and we would be, I won't go through the details, but let's just say there would be a lot of blood and um, and people must have got used to it. The children must have got used to it. You know, I can't, it sort of boggles my brain. You know, we have the kids here dancing and, you know, enjoying themselves with all the music. Imagine what it would be if they were watching us sacrifice animals. It's a horrible thought, but sacrifice was part of the worship of people. And the idea of sacrifice was to bring something of value to give to the Lord, to show much how, how much you valued Him. If you were a farmer, you would bring one of your animals. If you had plantations, you'd bring some of your food. Whatever you would have, you'd bring some of that stuff. And Jesus was familiar with that too. They did that in Jesus' time. You remember when Jesus cleared the temple out in the foyer or out in the courts, they had all these people selling birds and animals and all all these different things and they were making money because if somebody came along and had forgotten to bring their little pet lamb or their cat, or, no, not the cat, if they'd <laughs> forgotten to bring some sort of thing for sacrifice, they would buy one at the last minute because that's what they did. Now, praise God, we don't have those type of sacrifices anymore. That was Old Testament stuff, but we are still called to sacrifice. We sacrifice in a different way. We sacrifice by giving up our time. We've given up our time to be here today. We sacrifice by giving to God, often through giving to others, making sure that people are provided for and looked after. We sacrifice through prayer. We take time out to pray that God's kingdom advances and that the kingdom of darkness would be pushed back. And we sacrifice through fasting as well. Jesus said that, 
When we pray, sometimes if we wanna get to another spiritual level, we need to add fasting to prayer as well. You remember that the disciples brought to Jesus a little boy that was demon possessed and they prayed for this little boy and they prayed every prayer they knew, but nothing seemed to shift that demon. And Jesus came and bang, He got rid of it. And the disciples said, why couldn't we do that? And Jesus said, that's a toughie. That type comes out by prayer and fasting. In other words, that you need the nuclear weapon of prayer here. You need something deeper than that. You need fasting. And we know that Jesus spent a lot of time fasting. Jesus didn't come up just because He was Jesus. And well, He probably did come up because He was Jesus and get rid of it. But Jesus was fasting as well. Jesus prayed a lot. We know that He fasted for 40 days and 40 nights as well. So Jesus practised these things. And so God calls us in this day and age to be people of sacrifice as well. So sacrifice is part of worship and also it's a very powerful spiritual weapon. Have you ever noticed that there is something that happens inside when we talk about any of these three things? When we talk about giving, there's a, ooh, there's a challenge there. When we talk about prayer, we're saying, okay, we're gonna go into prayer and fasting. Ooh, something that challenges us. Prayer, that means sort of spending time and prayer's so boring and oh my goodness, you know, how am I gonna do that? There's so many other things I've gotta do and you have a list in your mind that goes on. And fasting, oh my goodness, you know, could I fast? Could I give up food? Will that mess up my, you know, all those things are sacrifices. Do you know an interesting thing? And I don't say this to put any condemnation on on anybody whatsoever. But every time we have a series on giving, I always hear there are people that boycott the series that they just don't come along. And I just sort of hear it. People say, oh, you know, such and such, they're not coming along as you're talking about giving. Oh, and when we do sort of a, a bigger series or we have a season where we give towards buildings, there are people that just don't come. And it doesn't offend me or hurt me. It just intrigues me. It's just an intriguing thing. Like, why would you, why would you not come? Um, do you, you know, is there a part of the Bible that you do not want to hear? Um, you know, like Jesus spent a third of his sermons talking on this topic. And it's sort of like people decide, well, that's, that's a topic I don't want to hear. I don't want to hear about that. Now, I don't think it's because people think, I am so generous that I don't need to hear anything else. I am the most generous person on the planet. I give away so much money. I live, I just live so much for other people that if I heard another thing about giving, it would be like eating too much cake. It would just be too much for me. But isn't it an interesting thing that happens in in hearts? I do, I refuse to listen to this topic. And yet it's such a biblical topic. Now, I don't say this to cause any offence either, uh, but there are two topics I notice that people really cringe about and I get quite a reaction. One is giving and the other is sexual immorality. When we've done a topic of sexual immorality, I see some people squirm. I talked a very hard hitting one a few years ago about pornography and sexual sin and a couple of people got up visibly upset and left. And because I knew their circumstances, I know, knew both of them were very, one was very in depth in sexual immorality, because he told me, and another one had a terribly deep addiction to pornography. And, and the, the challenge was just too much for them. They just got up visibly upset and walked out. And do I apologise for talking about those subjects? Absolutely not. Because that's exactly what we need to do. We need to come into the presence of God and let God speak into our hearts and push on those buttons that are a bit tender. You know, around the world, there are pastors that are falling over in sexual immorality. And, you know, some people might say, oh, this is the devil going on. I wanna tell you, this is the mercy of God. It's the mercy of God. Because it is much better that your sexual sin gets exposed here on earth and you get a chance to fix it than you stand before Almighty God with it not having been fixed. So it's the mercy of God. And I wanna challenge us what area whatever area of touchy point we have in our hearts, let's take the challenge and let's fix those things. And so if we need to hear sermons on pornography or sexual sin or giving or any of these other things where God wants to come and change our hearts, let's be up for it. Let's say, God, I'm up for the challenge. I, I, wanna, I wanna come into this area because it is an area of spiritual warfare. And it 
If it causes spiritual turmoil in your heart, it means it's pressing on a button. It means it's pressing on a button. And instead of running away from the button, you need to face it head on and say, what is the button that this thing is pushing? What is the thing that's going on here? So, you know, it's interesting too with prayer and fasting that some people think that prayer and fasting is just not for them. And I want to challenge in your hearts, I know you probably don't mind if other people pray and fast, but would you ever pray and fast? Ask the question to yourself, would you be seen at a prayer meeting? Because I think some people think that prayer and fasting is just an optional thing for others. It's just for those sort of spiritual fanatics. It's for those people that are sort of really into it, but I'm just a normal Christian that goes about my work and I don't get involved in all the extreme stuff. But Jesus didn't say prayer and fasting is extreme stuff. Jesus said prayer and fasting is just the day-to-day bread and butter. It's just what we do. So I wanna challenge you in that area as well. Are you a prayer? And are you open to fasting? Don't just think, oh, this church, you know, prayer and fasting, they're into that extreme stuff again. Let it be a challenge to your heart as well. It's not a fanatical thing to do. It is a thing that God calls us all to do. I wanna tell you that Christianity is a whole package. You don't get to choose the bits you want and throw the other bits out. It comes as a whole package. It's it's not like going to McDonald's and you drive up at the drive-through and you would say, hi, I would like to have a family pack of salvation today. I understand that's free at the moment. And when they say, would you like giving, praying and fasting with that, sir? You say, no, thanks, I don't need the extras. (laughs) Because they might cost me something. We don't get that option. It's a package. And the package is that we get salvation. We come to follow Jesus. We come to be like Him. And that's what He's calling us to. We can't leave out the bits that challenge us. We can't leave out the bits that, that, that cause us to sacrifice. And the Holy Spirit, His job is to convict us, not to condemn us. And I'll tell you the difference between convicting and condemning. Condemning is where God says, you are not worthy, you're going to hell. That's condemnation. Conviction is where He says, you know what, you really should be doing this. You should be listening to this. This is an area where your life needs to change. It's not condemning, it's not putting you down, it's not saying you've got no hope, that's condemnation. It's convicting you, say, come on, you can do better than this. This is an area that I'm challenging you in. You see, the purpose of our lives as Christians is to grow as disciples. You know, when we become Christians, the Holy Spirit comes in us and He challenges us to become more and more like Jesus. That's a process called sanctification. And I don't know whether you know people who are new Christians, but if the Holy Spirit is working properly, I think of me when I became a new Christian, I couldn't stop reading the Bible. I was reading it and I was underlining it and I was spending my last minutes at night and my first minutes in the morning. I couldn't stop reading the Bible and I couldn't stop going to church. I went, every time the doors were open, I was at church. The the morning service, sometimes I'd go to two in the morning and I'd go at night and I'd go to other churches for conferences and seminars. I just went to everything because I was passionate and I learned how to become generous as well. That was a big thing that took a while for God to be able to do in my heart. But He convicted me on it and said, I want you to be a, 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 a generous person. Now, friends, if your hearts are not like that, then that means that something's wrong. It means that the Holy Spirit is not able to work properly in your heart. You know, when you go along to the doctor and they give you blood tests, you know, they analyse things and they say, what's, what, how is your body working right and how is it working wrong? What are the areas that, that aren't quite right? And God does the same sort of thing. He looks at us and He says, there's this area here that needs to improve. There's this area here where I need to be able to work. But you know, as we go on, we become very good at closing the doors and stopping God from being able to move. It's very easy to become cynical and distracted and lukewarm. Do you know what? We are either going in one direction or we're going in the other. We're either becoming more like Jesus or becoming more selfish. We're either becoming more passionate about God's kingdom or we're becoming more cynical and more mocking. And I wanna challenge you, which which of those camps are you in? 
becoming more like Jesus or becoming more selfish. We're either building God's kingdom or we're building our own kingdom. The Bible talks over and over again. There are two kingdoms. There's God's kingdom and there's your own kingdom, e.g. Satan's kingdom, same thing. We're either building God's kingdom or we're just building ourselves. And Jesus talks about the opposite ways we can live in Matthew 6, verses 19 to 21. Jesus says, don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will be also. See, we can either be diligently and passionately working to build up things on earth, building up treasures, building up assets, building up things, or we can be working to build up the Kingdom of God. Now, the Bible says that if we worry about the Kingdom of God, He'll worry about our Kingdom for us. He says, if you put your heart towards me, I'll take care of all the basics. I'll make sure you have food. I'll make sure you have housing. I'll make sure I'll be generous in what I give you. But the Bible says that if we spend all of our time concentrating on this, there's another verse that says we lose our soul because this becomes our treasure. And I wanna challenge you today, where is your treasure? Is your treasure in Jesus or is your treasure in stuff? Jesus said a little bit later on in Matthew 6, verse 24, no one can serve two masters for you will either hate one and love the other. You'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. You know, people can be enslaved to money. You become a slave to it and you don't even realise it's happening. You don't even realise what's going on. It's just happening. It's like the old frog, frog in, the, in the kettle thing. As things slowly warm up, you know the story, the, the frog dies. He doesn't realise what's going on. We've had some discussions recently about the dangers of asbestos because we know a person who died recently uh, of asbestosis. And here's a person that was a tradesman for years and years and years and, you know, going into roofs before they knew all the dangers of asbestos and breathing all this stuff in over years and years and years. And then finally it accumulates and, and it ends up by killing him. And we're actually having a discussion because there are other people that we know that have been breathing in and even in recent times, breathing stuff in. And often you're in an atmosphere and you don't realise what you're breathing in. You don't realise that what you're taking in is dangerous. And it's exactly the same with spiritual things. When you get a love of money, when you get a love of things, when it takes over your heart, you usually don't realise what's going on. And this is why God warns us. God doesn't personally care about money at all. He cares about our hearts. He cares about uh, where our hearts are at because He doesn't wanna lose us. And so this constant battle that's going on for our lives, constant battle that's going on in our minds. Uh, recently, I started going to the gym again. Now, I know to look at me, you probably think that I've been going to the gym for years and <laughs> six days a week and sort of, um, you sort of think, you know, you and Arnold Schwarzenegger, either, I've, either you know, you're, um, you're exercising together, but, but this will come as a shock. That hasn't been the case. So I started going along to the gym and one of the things that I've realised is that it takes sacrifice, doesn't it? It takes sacrifice. I mean, they're, they're freezing mornings in the mornings and it's, it's much easier just to lie in bed and think about exercise, isn't it? <laughs> or you can be really spiritual and you can say, I'm gonna lie in bed in the warmth and I'm gonna pray. Do you like that one? I'm gonna pray. Um, God says to me, you can exercise and pray as well. So then you're killing two birds with one stone. Anyway, um, to, to exercise, you've got to have a sacrifice. One is getting up out of your nice warm bed. It's going outside in the freezing cold, de-icing your car, driving somewhere at some ridiculously early hour in the morning and getting on all these wretched machines <laughs> and, and, and putting your, your body through just a bit of torture. Now, the problem is that if you don't do that, nothing ever happens, nothing changes. Because there's a principle in life that if you don't make a sacrifice, nothing happens, nothing changes. And what I've discovered in the gym is that you've got to always take things up a click. 
So if you're on one machine and you do 20 minutes, that say you're on a treadmill and it's sort of at a certain incline, the next time you maybe wanna put it up a bit of an incline and you wanna make it a little bit faster. And maybe you wanna go a little bit longer because otherwise if you do the same thing every day, you never make any progress. And all the machines, you know, I start off on some of the machines, you know, to, to lift things. And, um, you know, you start off with one and I start pretty near the top on some of these weights. Like, wow, you know, the, the one before is right down the bottom. And you think, how could anybody, you know, how could six people lift that thing? So I start up near the top and just do a little bit and then I slowly put it down. You increase what you can do. You increase the sacrifice so it builds spiritual muscles. And so each time I go there, I'm trying to go up a click. I may do a little bit longer. I may do it a little bit harder. I may do an exercise that's a little bit more vigorous than it was before. And that's the way, hopefully, you get fit, more fit, and you, you lose weight and you, you improve your body. Friends, it's exactly the same with the spiritual life. You know, we start off in a certain place and it does take sacrifice, but if we don't go up a click each time, it actually, we never improve. If we just pray the same way we did 20 years ago, we haven't improved. If we give the same way we did 20 years ago, we haven't improved. If we don't fast or if we, you know, don't fast much, we haven't improved. And all these things are spiritual exercises that help us to grow spiritually and to push back temptation and the things that Satan puts in front of us. You know, so I want to look at my life and think, can I go up a click? Can I pray just a little bit longer? You know, are there ways that I can improve my prayer life? I want to give just a little bit more. If, I'm, if I give at this level, can I put it up a click than what it was before? I do that each year. I say, we, we talk about it and we say, we're at this level here. How can we go up a click? Not for the sake of the church or anyone else, but for our own sake, for our own you know, for our own generosity sake, am I becoming more of a generous person or if I'm, I'm becoming less of a generous person? John Wesley, who was an incredible person to do with uh, money and giving and things, he said, if my, if, my stand, if my pay goes up, I don't make my standard of living go up, I make my standard of giving go up. Isn't that cool? <laughs> I don't increase my standard of living, I increase my standard of giving. So... You know, one of the things uh, with prayer is that it will increase what happens in our soul spiritually. When we fast, it will bring us closer to the presence of God. And when we give, it will increase our capacity uh, to, to hear God speak and to be generous. It makes us bigger people. I had a conversation with a young couple uh, just recently who've been, uh, they're newly married and they're trying to juggle all their finances and different things. And uh, they were about to book a big international airfare of something they needed to go and do. And um, they were, the fares were just so extraordinarily expensive. Now, I had no input into this decision. That they just told me about this afterwards. They said, um, we sat down, we looked at all our finances. It didn't all match up. We had these big affairs to do. And they said, God convicted us that we hadn't actually given our tithe for a long time. They don't belong to our church, by the way. We hadn't given our tithe for a long time. So they said, let's just put everything in order. So they hadn't tithed for three months. So they, they put their money in, they gave three months to the church. And when they did that, they felt spurred to go back to the air fears, they went back to the year fears and found that they had dropped by the exact amount that they'd actually given uh, in their tithe. They'd, th there was this special sale, just one day, bang, those year fears dropped. And they talked to me and they said, wow, isn't that incredible? You know, it, we felt like we'd put God first and suddenly everything just came into place. And it helped them to be able to say, we can trust God. Um, so I, I want to just, just, a few things have happened just recently that have, have spurred me to talk about this. Um, I've talked with numbers of people um, who often have elderly relatives who over the years have become incredibly wealthy. Nobody in this church. But the people have said to me, these relatives have become scarily miserly, like scarily miserly. One man was telling me about his father that doesn't come to this church. He said, my father is a multi, multi-millionaire and he is the scroogiest person you could possibly imagine on the planet. He said he, will, he would not give a dime to a relative who was dying. 
He is just so scroogey. He said, you know, my dad, who was a tradesman, would come over and help us and then he would send us a bill at the end, you know, for, for the standard rates of, of, you know, what he was doing. If they went for meals, he would send a bill to charge them for what, for what they had. I mean, we laugh, but that is a scary spiritual place to be in. Isn't that a scary place to be in? And I've had, heard numbers of stories like this just recently about, now that, well, this is not a person that doesn't have any money. This is a person who is a multi, multi-millionaire who cannot, and I know of another situation where uh, there's a person who's a multi, multi-millionaire, has gone into a rest home. It's nobody that comes to this church or anything like that. It's gone into a rest home. There's this millions of dollars sitting in assets and they cannot give money to help this woman have a decent life in hospital because we've got to keep the money. Man, when we get to that, that is a terrible spiritual stronghold. That's a terrible spiritual stronghold. But I tell you what, it doesn't take many steps down the road of breathing in asbestos to actually get to that place where money just takes control of your heart. And you know what the remedy is? The remedy is generosity. Don't ever let yourself become like that. You know, some people have said to me over the years, I wanna make an enormous amount of money because then I wanna be incredibly generous. And I virtually have never, ever seen that happen. But what I've discovered is if you're not generous when you're poor, you will never be generous when you're rich. Uh, we had a guy, I met a guy overseas once and he came over to visit us. He'd heard about our church and he, I, I, he told me he was a multi, multi-millionaire and he gave money into uh, um, all these different things. He said, I just live to make money for the kingdom. He said, everything I get just goes straight out into the kingdom. He's started orphanages and all these different things. And I said to him one day, I said, you seem to be a, a bit of a rarity. I said, you know, money doesn't seem to have destroyed you. Most people I know when they get money, it just, they just become really greedy. I said, said, why do you think money changes people? He said, I think you're wrong in what you're saying. He said, money doesn't change people. It just magnifies what's already in your heart. Isn't that interesting? It magnifies what's already in your heart. See, if you're generous when you don't have much, you'll be generous when you have a lot. If you're miserly when you don't have much, you'll be miserly when you have a lot. See, generosity has almost got nothing to do with how much money you've got. It's got to do with what's going on in your heart. John Wesley, one of my uh, favourite spiritual heroes, the father of the Methodist movement said, when I have money, I get rid of it quickly, lest it finds its way into my heart. Isn't that good? And friends, if you're honest, if I'm honest, this is a danger for all of us that money would find its way into our heart. Do you know, Jesus said in Mark chapter 4, verse 19, Satan uses riches to deceive you and money will choke the spirituality out of your heart like a big weed strangling your heart. That's a paraphrase of Mark chapter 4, verse 19. Satan uses riches like a weed to come and strangle the generosity, strangle the spiritual life out of your heart. So we've got to be careful. In 1 Timothy 6 verse 10, uh, Paul says, for the love of money, not money, but the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. Do you know, money can be like a drug. The more you get, the more you want. My dad used to say that to me all the time. Because I'd get something, then I want something else. And he'd say, you know what? It's a principle in life. The more you get, the more you want. It's actually biblical. Ecclesiastes 5 verse 10. Those who love money will never have enough. How meaningless to think that wealth brings true happiness. I want to give you a wee challenge before we close. How generous are you? You don't need to call out. Rate yourself on a scale of one to 10, just to yourself. How generous are you? If God was looking into your heart and you were answering a question, if God asked you that question, how generous are you? Where would you place yourself on a scale of one to 10? And I'm picking that no one's gonna say 10. So that means every one of us have room to expand in our hearts. We've got room to expand. And so we should be keen to hear from God, saying, God, how can I become more of a generous person? 
Now, I've been to funerals uh, in recent times where people have been extraordinarily generous. And all these stories have come out. I never sit in a funeral where a person has got, accumulated massive amounts of wealth and massive amounts of things, but as a Scrooge, I never ever come away of that thing. Oh, I'd just love to be like that. Oh my goodness, if only I could be like that, where I have lots and lots of money that's all tucked away in the bank. I just bless myself and my family and the world has not changed. Oh, to be like that. But people who are generous, people who help save other people's lives, people who help others to go forward, who, don't you come away from funerals like that and say, I want to be a better person? I wanna be more like that? Well, that's what Jesus is saying. I wanna tell you something, a couple of quick thoughts before we go. It's not the amount of money that makes us generous. It's the amount of sacrifice that makes us generous. You could have a big appeal and a multi, multi, multi millionaire can give 10,000 bucks. And that may not be generous because it might be just nothing to them. But a person who's on a sickness benefit might give $5 and that might be massively generous because that's all they have, because that's a sacrifice. God does not look at the amount, He looks at the heart. And we see this in, in Luke 21, one to four, Jesus was in the temple, He was watching rich people dropping their gifts in the collection box. Then a poor widow came by and dropped in two small coins. I tell you the truth, Jesus said, this poor widow has given more than all the rest of them for they have given a tiny part of their surplus. That is the bit that sticks in my heart. The rich have given a tiny part of their surplus. So I've paid all my bills. I've done everything for me. I've got everything I want. I've got this massive surplus. I'm just gonna give a wee tiny part of that to the things of the kingdom. Just a tiny, tiny little part. Ouch. Whereas there's this widow and she gives two little coins and everybody would look at that, ha, ha, ha. That's not much, is it? What's that gonna do? And Jesus looks at that and He says, I love that heart because it's not about the money. It's not about the amount. It's about what is going on in that person's heart. And that woman would have spiritually grown massively because she got it. She got the lesson. So I wanna close with this. We're actually in a very generous church. You may have heard that in the last couple of weeks, somebody, and I, have, I actually don't know who it is, somebody donated a car to someone. And as a church, we were able to give that car to a couple who have not owned a car, who need a car. Is that a wonderful thing to be able to do? There's a family in this church that have given away a whole house to another family that needed a house because they didn't have one. Isn't that massive generosity? There's one young family in the past a few years ago that so believed in our Chilm Street project, they sold their whole house and gave all the proceeds of it. We tried to beg them not to, but they, they did it. They wanted to do it. Extraordinary act of generosity. And a couple of years ago, they called us and they said, God's given us more back than we have ever had before. We cannot believe how good God's been. Young man, just in the last couple of weeks, had just new to town, had all his tools stolen, $3,000 worth. And we took up an appeal and, and we gained all that money back to be able to give it. Imagine what that does to that young man's life. You know, we pray each week for a, for a family. There's a husband that's very sick. They haven't been able to work. They've needed help. This church raised $67,000 to be able to help them. Doesn't that, just, doesn't that just scream the kingdom of God to you? Doesn't that just scream the kingdom? Does that impress you or are you more impressed if you know that 50 people that come along have got $200 million sitting in their accounts all locked away? <laughs> what impresses you more? We had a man that came along who had motor neurone disease that needed a special van. We raised $100,000 so that man would be able to have his special van. I know other families here who have helped, helped other people into houses. They've either had a, a rental house or they've had another house. They've been able to help people get into other houses by taking a, a big loss of income themselves. 
Other families have helped people get out of debt. They've discovered a debt that somebody has and they felt compelled by the Holy Spirit to help that person out of debt. Do you know, some people have a spiritual gift of making money. They've got a spiritual gift and some of them use it for themselves, but many of them here use it for others. Isn't that exciting? And I'm sad that we can't bring them all up here and say, hey, these are all these people because it's a thing that happens in secret. But you will be pleased to know we have a lot of people like that in our church. But I tell you something, you do not need to be a multimillionaire to be generous because it's not about the amount, it's about the heart. It's what God is doing in your heart. So final thing and then I'm done. Final thing and then I'm done. I don't know about you, but I want to become a more generous person. So I want all the sermons I can get about generosity. Bring them on. And I wanna hear about prayer because I don't pray enough. And I wanna hear about fasting because I certainly don't fast enough. I want to go up clicks. And I'm asking you, would you join me in that, in that, in that journey? Would you come to the gym with me? Not the, not the physical gym. Not the, no, please don't come and watch. Please don't come and watch. Please don't come and watch. Actually, I saw this very funny thing um, uh, on the internet the other day. It'll come up on the screen. It's about going to the gym. The, the doctor asked me to spend at least one hour per day on the treadmill. So there are different things that we can do when we get to the gym. That's one of them. But it's never gonna get you spiritually fit. And so I wanna challenge you, let's not be scared of these topics. Let's, let's rate ourselves and let's say, you know, I could get better at this. If you're not good on the treadmill, spend more time on the treadmill. If you're not so good on the um, rowing machine, then get on the rowing machine. If you're not so good on the other contraptions that people go on, then, then get on those things and develop muscles. We need to get good at giving. We need to get good at praying. We need to get good at fasting. And in these coming weeks, we're gonna be talking about it. And I, I challenge you, don't run away. Don't run away, face it full on. Nobody goes into your account and sees what you give, only God. Nobody goes and checks and nobody says, oh, this person here is not very generous. I don't know. It's just simply between you and God. But that's the most important place for it to be. So can we increase being generous, being prayerful and being people that fast? 